Looks like the crowd has gotten smaller, but um, we'll do the best that we can. First, I want to acknowledge my parents, uh, Angelo and Elma Coakley, without whom I would not be here today. I also want to thank my wife, Dr. Jermaine Awad, for supporting me during the good and bad times, stimulating and challenging my intellect and believing in me when I have not always believed in myself. You are brilliant, and one day your work will be acknowledged for its importance in recognizing the invisible ethnic minority status of Middle Easterners and Arab Americans. I also want to thank the multicultural icons and pioneers in the field. Dr. Daryl Wing Sue, Dr. Janet Helms, Dr. Thomas Parham, Dr. Robert Carter, Dr. Joseph Pantorado, my mentor and ancestor, Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dr. Rosie Bingham, and countless others whose scholarship influenced me and whose hard-fought battles made it possible for me to be a professor and to do the work that I do. Now, we may not always agree, but I greatly respect the work that you have done. And finally, I want to thank all of my students, past and present. They may not realize it, but I learned as much from them as I hope they learned from me. The title of my talk is Against the Odds, a personal story of race, identity, and achievement. So how did a little black country boy from Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, with a population less than 1,500 people, end up going to one of the top universities in the country, getting a bachelor's degree, and then getting a master's degree, and then getting a PhD. And how did this little black country boy end up teaching at the top public university in the state of Texas, widely considered to be one of the best public universities in the country? Over the years, my students have looked at me with a combination of pride and awe. In many instances, they have not had a black professor much less a black male professor. They often assumed that I was one of those students who made straight A's all through school and that I never struggled in school. All they see is Dr. Coakley, the accomplished professor. They find it hard to believe when I tell them that no, I did not make straight A's and that sometimes I actually did struggle in school. Now, even though I was a good student and enjoyed school, my earliest memories of school are not all positive. In kindergarten, I was identified to be part of a remedial speech therapy program. My mother tells me that this was the case because white teachers back then did not think <clears throat> that black students knew how to speak correctly. The teacher for this program would lose patience with me and the other students when we were unable to correctly enunciate words. I was embarrassed and ashamed to have to participate in the program and I became self-conscious about the way I spoke. I was made to feel dumb and inadequate. Fortunately, I had strong, supportive, and active parental involvement in my education. I worked hard to improve my speech and to become a good speaker. Like many kids, I was a very active student. I enjoyed school and I loved to learn. My energy would sometimes get me in trouble because I was prone to talking too much when, I, when work needed to be done. In fact, I'm still prone to talking too much. <laughs> this was a time of innocence for me. I was completely unaware of issues of race. <clears throat> that innocence was shattered in an instance after a teacher reprimanded me. One day as I was talking to some classmates, I made a comment about the weight of my teacher. I was only a child, and I did not understand that it was not polite to talk about someone's weight. I apparently called her fat. She overheard me and confronted me immediately. She reprimanded me, telling me that what I said was not a very nice thing to say. She then looked at me squarely in the eyes and asked, how would you like it if I said something about you being black? That was the first time in my young life that I had any thoughts about anything related to my color. I knew that I looked different than my teacher and the rest of my classmates, but I had never really thought about it. And yet there I was on the verge of tears over her comments. I remember the hot flush of embarrassment that swept over me as the little eyes of my mostly white peers stared at me. It is memories like these that awaken my awareness of race and that, as Cornel West so aptly put it, race matters. By high school, I had been identified as a smart student. I believed that I was a good student and making good grades was a part of my identity. 
The most influential event for me was when I was accepted in a summer enrichment program for academically gifted minority students, mostly African American and poor white students. I had never been in a setting where there were, were large numbers of serious, goal-oriented, academically gifted black students. The pride that I felt for being selected to participate in the program was immeasurable. This experience was the first explicit experience that connected my identity as a black student to my academic performance. This experience changed my life forever. I was the first black student from Pilot Mountain to get accepted to Wake Forest University on a need-based academic scholarship. Wake Forest is a small, highly selective, private liberal arts school that had mostly upper middle class white students. It was a very difficult transition for me. I had a lot of pressure on me to do well because I was representing not just myself, but also my family. I felt that so many people were invested in me doing well, which is why I felt so much pressure to not disappoint folks back home. Academically, Wake Forest was the most challenging four years of my life. By the time I graduated, my ego and academic self-concept had been badly bruised. Unfortunately, I can't tell you my whole life story in seven minutes. I tired myself, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> so, so let me fast forward to the present. As a black psychologist and professor, I have spent most of my professional career researching and teaching, trying to understand the psychology of African Americans, especially the attitudes that black students have about school and education. Why did President Obama, when he gave the 2004 Democratic National Convention keynote back when he was still Senator Obama, say that we have to eradicate the slander that says a black youth with a book is acting white? How can a people whose ancestors created civilization, built the Great Pyramids, pioneered basic arithmetic and perfected mathematics and medicine long before Europeans even knew what they were, and gave the world science, astronomy, ethics, religion, arts, morals, you get the picture, a people who were forcibly removed from their African homeland and brought to the United States in 1619 and enslaved for almost 250 years a people who have been the moral conscience of America, how did we get to the point that a people with this rich history and legacy have youth whose society says don't value education and believe that doing well in school is acting white? I have been concerned about the racial and ethnic identity development of black students and how their identity impacts their academic achievement and attitudes towards school. In many ways, my research reflects my experiences as a black male trying to negotiate the challenges of excelling academically in a predominantly white elite white university. And I can think of no better discipline to do this work than counseling psychology, with its emphasis on a developmental perspective that focuses on strengths, adaptive strategies, and resilience, rather than focusing on deficits, illness, and psychopathology, and blaming racial and ethnic minorities for their conditions when they are often responding to systemic and systematic oppression. And for creating this space, I say thank you to counseling psychology. <laughs>